Hello there. Welcome back. My name is Lars Hammer. I'm the pastor here at Lord of Grace Lutheran Church in Marana, Arizona. I want to welcome you back to my walk through the Psalms. If you've been following me online, you'll know that I did a bunch of these videos starting uh, back in 2020, I think, uh, during COVID. Uh, I picked the Psalms because it was a way of sort of walking through the scriptures, but giving voice to pain, frustration, anxiety, which I know we were all going through a lot during COVID. Not like that stopped, but in COVID it was especially good. And I, I almost maybe it was for myself partly too, as a way to walk through my own spiritual struggles. Uh, because that's what the Psalms are. The Psalms are very much ordinary people writing down, putting to poetry, putting to music, the struggles that they have in life. The Psalms are not, they're not a whole bunch of um, God is great and, and nothing bad happens. There's lots of God is great, but there's lots of God is great along with my life is really a struggle now, God. And the contrast is everywhere in the Psalms. So the Psalms are a good thing to pray through. So anyways, I had gotten up to the beginning of Psalm 69 in the other videos. And so now I'm going to pick up from there. We'll start at Psalm 69 verses 13 through 15. And what I'm going to do is I'll just, I'll read through the verse and then I'll leave it on the screen. If you're at home, you can also pick out your NRSV Bible because that's the translation I use, the New Revised Standard Version. And I'll do, read, we'll read through the We'll read through the particular verses uh, and then I'll just kind of walk through them and give you some of my thoughts and my reflections. I hope they'll be helpful to you in your own spiritual life and your own walk with the Lord. I'm going to do this in a little series of six uh, that I'm going to do. I don't know if, when I'll be able to catch up with them next. We'll see how my time allows. But we'll pick up today at Psalm 69 verses 13 through 15. So here goes. Let's read through this. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. All right, there we go. So let's begin with verse 13. Let's look at that. As for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. What's going on here? In the context of this, it's a psalmist who is feeling very alone, because feeling like everybody else around is worshiping other gods, and they're taking their prayers to lots of gods. We know throughout reading the Old Testament, particularly the prophets, that this was a big issue in ancient Israel, that people would worship the Lord God, but they'd also worship other gods too. And that's a kind of a common way that paganism works. It's not exclusive. So you can have your Baal, you can have an Asherah, you can have a Thor, you can have a Mithras, you can have a whatever you want. You can pile up all the gods. The Romans, who would come later, would literally put them all on a shelf. They'd have a shelf with all the idols would line up. So it wasn't uncommon for ancient Israelites to, on the one hand, say, yes, I, I pray to the Lord God, but I also pray to these others too, kind of like they're hedging their bets. But God always demands this kind of singular obedience uh, that says, no, I don't want you worshiping the others. I want you coming just to me. Because if you really trust me, you won't need all the others too. And if you're going with the others too, if you're keeping a foot over there, if you're hedging your bets, you're not really trusting me. You're not giving me your whole self, right? As it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. It doesn't say love the Lord your God with a portion of it, but love all these other things too, right? And so that sort of singular exclusivity, but the truth is if you're the one who's being singularly exclusive towards the Lord God and everyone else is hedging, it can get to feeling very lonely, right? Everyone else is busy at the Baal uh, prayer festival or whatever they did, and you're sitting at home alone and you're going, man, 
This is kind of a lonely place to be. And so the psalmist in the first part of this psalm laments all these people turning away to other things and turning to evil and then says, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. In contrast to those people, you know, I will pray unto you. A little bit remember at the end of Joshua where he says, as for me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. So the Psalm is saying kind of the same thing. They may go this, but as for me, I worship you, God. And he's starting his prayer this way, why? Because he's a little bit kind of hinting to God, you know, God, I'm putting all my eggs in your basket. I'm putting all my trust in you. Can you listen, you should listen to me then, right? You owe me at least that much. I, and so then it goes on, verse 13. But at an acceptable time, O God, uh, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. Now, what does that mean, at an acceptable time? I always look at this as kind of a psalmist trying to acknowledge that he's being patient, right? You know, we often are very impatient when we ask God for things. We often want, we want what we want, and we want it now. And the psalmist is saying, you know, it's sort of admitting, I know God, you work on your own time and I know you work on your own schedule and I know you do things kind of your own way. And so I am not going to be so presumptuous as to assume that I know the right time for you to answer prayers. I am going to simply uh, acknowledge that I would like you to answer me, but I'm willing to wait for the time that is right for you at an acceptable time. Well, when is that acceptable time? It's whenever God decides it's an acceptable time. And we know this with prayer, we know this with our lives, that we need to keep a patience and an openness for things to happen on God's time. So that's what the psalmist is saying. Um, at an acceptable time, God, you can e e please answer me, but I'm willing to wait for the time that you think is the right time for you. Uh, in the abundance of your steadfast love, what's that about? Uh, it's the psalmist hinting that God has said, look, God has told the people, I am the God of love, I love my people, I promise I'll take care of you. And so the psalmist is saying, well, you know, you did say you were a God abounding in love for your people. You know, since you are such a loving God, Maybe you should think about me and answer me. Sort of holding God accountable to what God has said, right? If you really are this loving God, in other words, you will listen to my prayer. You will heed my prayer. You, you, you don't really have a choice, do you? Because you're such a loving God. But then again, I know you're such a loving God. So it's like part flattery, part holding them accountable, right? Um, and, you know, we do that with each other since I know that you're, you know, we'd say to our spouse, since I know that you're so good at cooking, maybe you can help me with dinner tonight. Uh, I don't know. That's not a great example, but something like along those lines, right? Reminding God, hey, you can answer me back. Okay. With your faithful help, rescue me from sinking in the mire. What an interesting image. I think we can, again, get hung up on the literalness of it. Don't get hung up on this. I don't think the psalmist is literally in a swamp. If he's in ancient Israel, there aren't many of those. It's pretty dry. But what is he talking about sinking in the mire? You gotta stew on that image for a little bit. How does it work? Well, if you've ever been through a swampy, boggy kind of area, like, and you've been through one like that, you know that one of the things that happens is when you go in, you can, it can create kind of a vacuum. Uh, and so when you try to pull yourself out, you can't pull yourself out because there's no air. Uh, to pull yourself out, there needs to be something to displace where your foot was. It's a very scary feeling when you're in a swamp or in a bog and your feet go in and suddenly you can't get your feet out. Now more than once when I've been out in a peat bog and I've gotten my feet in, what you do is you can uh, pull off your shoes or your boots, pull your foot out, and then that lets the air in, and now you can get your uh, boot out later. It, but you get that vacuum. So you gotta think about this. Po poetry is full of images, right? You gotta kinda delve into it a little bit. Sinking in the mire. So the, the, the psalmist is saying essentially, if you look at this figuratively, my life has become like, like this mire. I've become stuck. 
and the things I've gotten stuck in, I've gotten so stuck in, I can't get out. And the more I fight to get out, the deeper I get in. And I have this feeling of a loss of control. I've lost uh, my sense of my ability to move. I've become powerless. I've become helpless. And I can't get out unless someone else gets me out. It's a very either a humbling or a demeaning feeling to be in, depending on how you got there. But that's what this idea of sinking in a mire, it isn't just like you're, it isn't just like, oops, I'm getting kind of mud on me. It's really the sense of getting stuck. And so he says, Lord, keep me, rescue me from sinking in the mire. Pull me out of this situation I'm in this problem I'm in, this life I'm in, that I feel I can't get out of. So it's a prayer for rescuing. Pull me out of this, God. Um, and, uh, but yet, at the same time, remember that he's, he's also asking God, do this at an acceptable time. So try to, to imagine being patient when you're stuck in the bog and you can't get out and you need help. And, and now you're supposed to pray for patience. Well, the psalmist does it. See, it's a contrast, but also kind of a contradiction. All right. Uh, and then it goes on. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Do not let the floods sweep over me. Uh, what is this all about? Well, Psalms are always about rescuing from enemies. There are so many Psalms about, Lord, rescue me from my enemies, deliver me from my enemies. They're, they're almost a dime a dozen. Uh, this is a constant problem. When you're the ancient Jewish people and you're this tiny little demographic surrounded by kingdoms that are all bigger than you, you're always surrounded by enemies. You're always the minority. You're always at other people's mercy. And so you're always asking, Lord, deliver me, right? You don't have, you're always coming to God from a position of powerlessness, which is very important to remember. Uh, when you're in a position of power, what do you pray for? You pray for God to protect your power. When you're coming from a position of powerlessness, what do you pray for? You pray for God to give you power, to rescue you, to pull you out of this. And so this is that familiar prayer. Um, is the enemies part of the mire? Do those images work together? Is that the enemies part of the situation that you're stuck in? Probably. Uh, and then you get some more poetic imagery here. Uh, don't let the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me or the pit close its mouth on me. Huh? What flood? Uh, what flood? Well, we don't know. You know, it's not, Noah, it's not the flood with Noah's Ark. It's not a global flood because God promised with Noah's Ark there wouldn't be another one. So I think it's, again, more of a, more of a poetic image right? The flood is too much for me to handle. The flood is uh, so much stuff coming at me, I can't handle it. Uh, is the flood some sort of a belief in a, a coming judgment? Maybe. But again, God promised not to wipe out the whole earth again. So that's probably not going to happen. The deep swallow me up. That phrase, the deep, is used a lot in the Old Testament particularly in the Psalms, as a reference to Sheol. And Sheol is the place where the dead go. And I know I've said this before, I'll say it a thousand times. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's no heaven and there's no hell. There's just a dry, dusty place called Sheol. And everybody goes there. Good go there, bad go there. David kills people, he sends them to Sheol. David dies, David goes to Sheol. Everybody goes to Sheol. One of the ways that Sheol is talked about is as the deep. So it's not just a little bit below the surface. It's, it's sort of way down there. And the idea of it being down there, I think, plays, part of it's an image, but it, part of the idea is that it's not easy to get out, right? It's, it's, beyond, our, it's beyond us, and it is, it's beyond our reach, beyond anything a human can get to or that a human can get out of. So don't let the deep swallow me up or the pit. Again, I think this is all ref these are references to Sheol. So don't let me die. <laughs> don't let me die and go down to Sheol and let that be the end of me, Lord. Rescue me according to the abundance of your mercy. Pull me out of the situation that I am in. And... Um,
So that's what this prayer is about. See, there's a lot, there's a lot in this if you kind of walk through each line like that. So that's what we have on Psalm 69. Uh, let, me, let me fade this out. That's what we got on Psalm 69, verses 13 through 15. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll pick up again later. And um, again, as always, feel free to message me or anything if you have questions or you need to talk more. Uh, thanks for tuning in. God bless.